Okay, you listen to Shadow Channel Podcast. This is another episode of Filler. We haven't had one since February, maybe? I forget. February or thereabouts. Joined by Laurie. Hey, Laurie. Hello. Oh. How you doing, man? I'm doing not too bad. When was the last time? You know, I think the last time you were on this show was last year. Yeah, I think it was, it was, it was, Javi, it was maybe think. when you first started putting together, was it the... Fillers or Filler, heads up yeah, yeah, half an hour of nothing in particular. We recorded it here. Uh, I think we've never really sort of taken advantage of the fact that we've got a decent living room to record in there instead yeah. of using like Matty's car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dash, dash dashboard get togethers. Yeah, man, those you know, I I look back on those days with with considerable fondness. Yeah, I mean, too, I really man. I was like, uh, like conversations sort of sprung out of nowhere, and uh, it would often lead. To fucking pretty bizarre places, but it was it was always good and it was always entertaining. So yeah, it was yeah good I mean, fun of making. Yeah, yeah, no, they were they were a huge amount of fun. I mean, it was about a month after me and Matty had started to put them together, and I think Kelly was on one of the earlier ones with a series called Patches, which is what Matty used to call his car. Yeah, and I don't know what he'd call his new car, syphilis maybe. <laughs> um, but I remember that you came on the show, right? I mean, I wouldn't even know if I would have classified it. It was just yeah, this came thing on that the we show. Did. We like <laughs> came on the show. Came hey, all man, over. You want to meet up and like yeah. record in the car? Hey, you want to come on the show? <laughs> Recording in an abandoned car park at half eleven at night, and you're cramming. I mean, good old dogging spot. But when we first came on the show, and we had a a little mini series of three episodes, all of which had you on them. Yeah, yeah. And technically, Velvet Chasm, which wasn't included but was part of those was same sessions three, wasn't there was, oh wait no no yeah well, there was a there was so. a there was a little trilogy of bullshit called ruthless yeah yeah I remember. uh and it was just yeah well, th- that was a great that you know but since about last summer I, mean, I had you on the show so thought today uh we could talk about what's going on in iraq we have a little politically semi-politically orientated one where we try and speculate about uh, people who people whose lives we know nothing yeah, about. Appeal to the <laughs> smallest possible audience <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And their plight against yeah. like for, ruthless for our own pure satisfaction because we yeah. just enjoy this stuff. Ruthless <laughs> fundamentalist sadomasochistic perverts. I mean just just deeply sexually repressed people, but I mean Enough about ourselves, let's talk yeah, about yeah. the fucking jihadis <laughs> in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're projecting. <laughs> yeah. We're projecting yeah, yeah. man. Um too much projection, but like <laughs> What's going on in Iraq is really interesting, man, because I think I said to you before, I was so tempted to like put a bet on, and I don't gamble, as to either what I would say, oh, okay, I've turned out to be right, bowing to ideology and trying to make it conflate with my worldview. You know? yeah, yeah. What is happening now does not conflict with what I believe. In fact, I will make it seem as though I've always believed this, although... Even when I was warned, I did not fully see what you know coming. What has now come yeah, yeah. in Iraq? I mean, what do you think about what's going on? Do you think it's? I mean, it's it's fucking nuts, but it's there's a, there's a spectacular element to ISIS, uh, the ISIS and 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 affiliated groups advance from the northern border of Iraq. In and and it's almost you know like watching a high speed chase in a film, except you realize that in part you're in the back seat of the car. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what do you reckon? I. Well, I mean, I feel like what we're seeing now is kind of, if not always destined to happen, uh, it's been in the works for some time that, you know, you have under Saddam Hussein massive repression of the majority by the minority, you know, these various sort of power-holding Sunni clans that seem to held held office, held power, you know, uh, friends of Saddam, that kind of thing, and... Uh, yeah, at the at the expense of the the vast majority of the, the sort of working population, you know, that were afraid to challenge, and yeah, with the fall of Saddam, you see the the leaders of the Shia community, particularly Muqtada al Sadr, which um, I know he doesn't actually mm-hmm. hold any office, but like we were discussing earlier, you know, the the Mehdi army uh, or Mehdi army, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mehdi, it, yeah, yeah, these Mukti. these huge sort of uh, Shia militia that have recently been mobilized under the command of Malachi or like under the request of Malachi mm. but let's be honest it's not really Malachi that's that's yeah. uh, making these people mobilise it's, uh, it's leaders like Muqtada al Sadr yeah uh, and uh, Ayatollah Sistani I believe his name is yeah the, yeah in leader. Iran I think yeah. he's one of the uh, or no no, no he's an Iraqi, Iraqi based Iraqi. Ayatollah yeah, among the, the Shia right, community right. it's one of those uh, Star Wars things where you can't tell who's the master and who's the apprentice <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. you know is, is, yeah. is, 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 uh, is the president or sorry the prime minister is he Maliki, is he the apprentice or is he the master? What do you reckon? I mean, there's a large Shia majority in the south of Iraq, obviously. Yeah, and I think that 
pretty much like like you were saying, you know, that uh, maybe maybe the maybe not quite the apprentice, not quite the master. I think that um, I, I, I want to stop short of calling him a puppet exactly because yeah. he's maybe what is seen as the acceptable face of politics or of Shia majority politics because Al Sadr, Muqtadr Al Sadr, you know, uh, he was militant. He was mm. vocally clerical you know that he wasn't someone that was even electable uh, last time around and i think that what they did was they exchanged perhaps control and real power into his hands yeah. in terms in in return for him supporting the malaki government and uh, his shia coalition which I'm, i can't remember yeah. the name of the uh, law and justice party yeah. i think it might be called um but yeah, you sort of you take a step back from power and you let someone yeah. like Malaki come in, and then he actually turns out not to be that impartial, that kind of um, open to uh, what would seem to be a unified Iraq, and he's pretty much driven along uh, Shia sectarian. sectarian lines. Yeah. yeah, and I mean the grievances are starting to come out. You've seen a monopolization of power amongst the the Shia and the Sunnis uh, are rightfully. I, yeah. I, well, I mean, you say rightfully. I mean, there's so much controversy there because for how long were the Shia repressed and suffered under Saddam? Yeah. And now, you know, well, that minority regime is removed, and what well, you expect them to just be cool with it? You know? Exactly. I mean, it's one of those. Yeah. yeah. It's it's one of those things where yeah, I suppose you know, master apprentice. Uh, I I probably agree with you. Yeah, he's most likely uh, the apprentice. To some extent, because I feel as though in a country like Iraq, which, to, you know, to some extent doesn't really consider itself to be a country on yeah, the ground, yeah. from the outside looking in, it's a country. Like it's almost like the West is just using sheer forth, uh, force of faith. Yeah, to, to we just this, we just need yeah. to will Iraq to be a country, and it will. You know, yeah, you sprinkle yeah. some fairy dust on it, and um, Maliki is is sort of has been put in place because he knows though that the support does not come from a nationalistic sense, but mm. it comes from a community basis. And he needs these Ayatollahs and... and, and uh, um, Clerical uh, leaders. Yeah, yeah Muqtada yeah. al-Sada. Because they are the really, the really the brunt of political power, which, I mean, communities and groups are the world over the brunt of yeah, political yeah. power in a local sense. But no more starkly do we see that than in the Middle East where you do have a lot of fictitious political entities masquerading as countries. Definitely, you know? and I think that that's like where you reach a major issue that for as much as I support the idea of a federal Iraq and how much I think that, that was a good move on the part of the international community to put that in place Agreed. over what was a brutal dictatorship under Saddam, you're introducing this federal democracy onto people that still operate in sectarian and ethnic lines and are not really interested in the politics of unity you know they're interested in right okay it's the same with libya and places like that you know that they were we're looking along the the sort of tribal lines and the historic lines that these people are still majorly concerned with rather than the ideas of federalism and the ideas yeah. of actually let's work together to rebuild this country's infrastructure use its massive oil wealth for the betterment of all yeah. people it's you no know, how much power can we grab for our particular yeah. sect our particular community and that's where the biggest problem is because to go on an issue that i know that's close to your heart as well as mine is uh, the issue of the kurds mm. that um in the federal constitution, or I believe at uh, some point after, you know, point in, during the formation of the parliament, the, the disputed city of Kirkuk would actually yes. be uh, discussed whether it would, re would it join the semi-autonomous semi region of Iraqi Kurdistan or whether it would remain part of the rest of Iraq. I don't, mm. couldn't tell you which particular province yeah. it sits in, but um, the... I, I, I don't know if it was a referendum where it would be discussed at federal level, but mm. there, there were supposed to be negotiations and discussions that took place around, you know, what happens to Kirkuk and, you know, um, what happens to the Sunnis that were basically, f like, forced settlement in there under yeah. Saddam. Do they move back? You know, is there a readdressing of this? And the, the situation's deteriorated to the point now where, like, say, the Iraqi army had no interest in maintaining their positions there. Mm. So... Kurdish Peshmerga forces, you know, they moved in, they secured the city, yeah. and it looks like they're not going to leave now. So, yeah. 
I think the, there's clear lines that are being drawn now. Um, in a lot of places, the Kurds have said that they'll, you know, they'll fight for their own territory. They will not allow ISIS or Sunni fighters that are, you know, jihadists that are looking mm. not really for um, for revolution. Uh, this is the big thing about ISIS that I believe that ISIS aren't concerned with revolution. They're concerned with territorial gains mm. and controlling people you yeah. know they, they're interested in having power over territory it's not mm. their interest to remove what they see as you know corrupt power such mm. as Assad or such as Malaki they're more interested in following in the footsteps of the revolutionaries that paved the path yeah and then cleaning everything up yeah. and saying we control this now I mean to and some extent gonna, they want to create make you live by our brutal rules exactly and that's the problem with these exactly as far like as I see it. in terms of the way of life I mean you're spot on to live by their rules uh, the interesting thing I've often thought that maybe the West might have uh, made the mistake of assuming uh, that the 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 Arab world particularly, mm. um, but you know the, the Muslim world generally, but mostly the Arab world, the epicenter of Islam, you know, Saudi, uh, well, Arabia, yeah, uh, and and the Levant and Iraq or Mesopotamia, Iran to some extent, Persia. Um, the idea that that what what we should be seeing there as healthy growth is the formation of nations. Although you could argue that that's a Western-centric viewpoint of what the development of a society is. I mean, if you go back 300 years, mm. the development of our society sprung from tribes uh, and then nations, and then there was a split during a period of religious denominational warfare, the Thirty Years' War. The idea is within the Peace of Westphalia that there's this idea of a nation. What they want to create, ISIS, is is an emirate mm. which is a country through a western lens to through a western lens but i feel as though it's not entirely the same thing as a country in the western sure, lens it's, not gonna have, it's a it's part not gonna have of the same sort of yeah, uh, they've shaved off a piece of what they consider if you imagine that the the part of the world where largely muslims live is just a big islam yeah. <laughs> they want to shave off a piece of islam and have it conform to their particular interpretation of Islam. No, it's kind of like a country, but not really. No, like where I, like so, I get that point of view that mm. there's a what is it like? Almost if we give them a bit of their caliphate, that they'll be mm. happy with that. No, what's the what's the right of the people that live within that mm. to? object to this caliphate exactly and yeah. what are their options if they want to move out of there are they going to be able to do that or are they going to be massacred exactly, already because yeah. they don't already subscribe to mm. these principles mm. this hardline view of sunni mm. islam which is not widely representative of mm. sunni believers although i believe that mm. there's elements of it that are probably sympathetic uh, in the wider mm. muslim sunni community well, what i mean by it view. specifically is that our interpretation of what a country is seems to conflict on the ground, quite stark, conf uh, you know, conflict between uh, what we, or contrast rather, between what we consider a country to mm. be and what they consider a country to be. They seem to consider a country, well, we're all Arabs, which is not entirely true, but through the eyes yeah. of yeah. Uh, some uh, group like ISIS, say, uh, the idea that you just take part of this Islam and you shave a bit off well, and you I govern it the way wrong. you want to govern it. You look to what a, uh, Saddam did in Kirkuk. Mm. Clearly, I mean, that's passive-aggressive ethnic cleansing. He didn't kill the Kurds, although he did try and kill them. I think it, but he just moved Sunnis in, who were not Kurds. Yeah. You know, so it's not that he's ethnically cleansing them. He's, he's enacting a settlement policy. He was policy, Arabizing. Which is, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Arabizing, which is yeah. ethnic cleansing by the back door. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it's this idea be, that ethnicities make up a nation, not a relatively modern concept. That, uh, ISIS is... Uh, in any way, a kind of Arab nationalist movement. I mean, if you look at their mass appeal for foreign fighters i don't think that can be said mm. to be the case I true think yeah. most of the people that come from european countries will not be coming from arab nations what well, like uh saudi arabia yemen mm. uh you know kuwait iraq uh syria in certain parts yeah um, i think that most of these fighters will be coming from North Africa, mm. uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, or like Bangladesh. Uh, ba well, Bangladesh. Well, I mean, I hailing think, from there, but coming yeah, from so their Bangladesh respective the European the countries. Yeah. The, um, I think that, that that seems to be the thing that I've noticed the most is that, if not half of the the British fighters that I've been made aware of for internet videos and things like that were of Bangladeshi origin. You know, uh, 
my question to them is what are you doing in an Arab Sunni Shia civil war mm. you know this is not about territory in that sense this is not about yeah. historic ties to the land this is about the imposition of a hardline caliphate which yeah. lives under the strict Islamic law and to be honest if they got their way I bet you half of them would fall short if yeah. not more would fall short of these own standards and they probably end mm. up the victim of their own thing do you think many of the people from the west who are who, whose families and heritage do hail from places like Pakistan and India and Bangladesh mm actually view this in a lens more similar to you and I, the idea of, of nations, but of also of political, uh, sorry, of religious denominations, because if you actually, interestingly, if you look at India and Pakistan, I'd say that that dispute is not so much religious anymore. No. It's actually a nationalistic dispute now. Very much, I yeah, think yeah. because of the force of Indian nationalism, which is not necessarily Hindu nationalism, because India has so has so many different ethnic and cultural and religious groups that er, that uh, Pakistan, which was originally conceived of along with uh, Eastern Pakistan yeah. in Bangladesh, as uh, a religious polity, has now become a nationalistic policy in response to they they they've kind of been contaminated by India's nationalism. I'd say, so I'd now say both case, sides oppose to, each other to, as nationalistic to, entities. To purely say it's that would be to ignore the. Uh, the suffering of uh, the Shia min- minority in Pakistan, um, mm. mainly places like Balochistan, which I mm. believe is, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, seems to have a certain concentration of Shia mm. Muslims, which uh, are regularly bombed yeah. by, uh, like, uh, oh god, I, I couldn't tell you the name of the organization, but you know, it's like a, it's a, pretty much like a Taliban yeah. style organization, you know, an Islamic militant group. Mm. That, I'm not massively uh, clued up with the. Geography of Baluchistan. I'm guessing it's near the Iranian border. If they have a large Shia minority, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to the uh, sort of southwest mm-hmm. of Pakistan. Yeah, I think that's where Balochistan is. Um, now, I th- yeah, I, my my kind of issue. Sorry, I, I kind of lost track of where we were. No, no worries, man. Yeah, it's completely like. Uh, your issue with regard to the India Pakistan thing, or your issue with regard oh no, it was to just the... it was just me. Yeah, it was really to, uh, like I agree with you that it's um, it's sort of nationalistic and mm, yeah, and its current uh, sort of uh, manifestation mm. this, uh, this tension yeah. between the two countries. But I mean, uh, you, I mean, you only need to look back at the Mumbai attacks. You know when uh, yeah. that that was a that was a, a jihadist sort of yeah you know uh, assault on mm. civil society as far as I see it. You know the but this goes on internally within Pakistan. I mean, what was it only a couple of days ago that uh, it wasn't Karachi? Or, ah, maybe it was Karachi Airport. No. Pesh, was it Peshawar Airport? I think Karachi Airport was attacked last week and then there was a jet yeah. that was shot at uh, Peshawar uh, Maybe airport. Lahore? Uh, I, I think it was Peshawar. Ah, oh, Peshawar. I, I really, I really... Yeah. Uh, the Karachi Airport thought, was definitely attacked yeah. recently. And yeah, was, but there was one, there was one today mm. or yesterday as well. Were those Islamists or were those actually uh, Pakistani Taliban? I mean, I'm not sure. See, I... Another yeah, form of Islamists, I, think, I suppose. I think there's actually quite a, maybe a degree of similarity between the two causes that mm. uh, these sort of tribal Taliban movements are really striving for their own autonomy within these regions and they want mm. to live by their own if I may say so barbaric rules yeah. and practices yeah, yeah. You know, let's let's veil all women let's not allow them to be educated someone's actually speaking out for education she's probably worth shooting in the head yeah. as a 15 year old girl yeah. you know that, that if that is your line of thinking then I, I don't even have words for it man it's just yeah. that it's it's beyond retarded you know it's uh, well yeah I mean there's there's a th- th- I, I think that, that that must come down to a certain degree of backwardness on the mm. part of your culture but also an unwillingness to progress yeah maybe that's based into you wanted to hold on to certain principles of your religion that you believe give I mean, say the man more power within the household, mm. and, you know, by extension, the society, you know, the, or the community, you know, that I, I think this is the, especially with the jihadist, the, I think you can say it globally, it's the, it's the policy of weak men that want to be strong. Yeah. That think that they can get something by force of arms yeah. and that by suppressing anyone that is scared of standing up to you and killing anyone that does stand up to you you will get 
what mm. you desire in life and that seems to me to be a rather petty amount of control over the yeah. lives of others and that's not something that necessarily interests me as a human being so i don't res- really understand the compulsion mm. on their part well yeah no i think you're you're 100 percent right i mean if you look at i mean because the middle of the world cup right now is we're having this conversation mm. we're doing this podcast and this is uh, luis suarez thing he's yeah, yeah. biting people and i've often heard it said that for some people who follow football mm. that football for them is uh, the act of outsourcing their masculinity right, so it's okay. two men in their mid 40s wearing football tops arguing about who's 19 year old is better yeah yeah you yeah, know okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and possibly getting into a physical confrontation <laughs> and they'll add a bit of religion in there I mean we have our own religious denominational problems they've still died, died down, down since the IRA went away largely in the 90s but I mean Sons as recent as the 90s there were bombings and killings yeah, and people drilling people's kneecaps and shit like that but if you uh, you know there there seems to be maybe this idea that you outsource your masculinity through your faith mm. in Islam mm. uh, but also I mean I watched the Star Trek episode recently I've been like marathoning Star Trek anybody out there you marathon Star, you know, Star Trek I mean do you a lot of good think about things through a human lens really changes your perspective uh, your perspective it's very interesting it's a very humanizing experience watching endless episodes of fucking star trek but <laughs> so um not much of a tricky but i understand what you mean yeah, yeah it's 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 a very immersive world not because it itself is the most uh sublime expression of uh science fiction that i've ever seen it's actually not but it's the the scope of it in a humanizing sense of thinking about things in a collective sense and, and changing perspective sort of zooming out a few hundred million miles um it's very interesting there's an episode where they land on an alien planet which is the minute they land they all begin to be affected by this alien disease and it's not actually a disease it's it's a virus that's been left behind by an ancient civilization that had died off right they die. I don't know. Their, their mating cycle had broken down. They just all died off, and they'd left their their genetic imprint in this virus, which causes any aliens who land on the surface to immediately begin to mutate into that species that had died off, as a way to preserve themselves. Yeah. They created a virus that changes people, any other alien species, into them, um, and they become feral and they begin to speak another language. And, and they all talk about getting back to Urquat or whatever it's called, this ancient city, which is sort of portrayed as a sort of similar kind of Mesoamerican kind of Incan Aztec kind of thing. And when they eventually, they're, they're so obsessed with getting back to the way things were. Yeah, yeah, and If yeah. they can only find, find Urquat, they'll be fine. Uh, I may cite the episode, but I've forgotten the name of it. It's in the third series of Star Trek Enterprise, I think. And when they eventually get to Urquat, they find that it's a bit like uh, Ayacucha, in Peru, it's just a ruin, mm. and I feel as though it's similar in in, in Islam, particularly Sunni Islam, um, to some extent that they're so desperate. If we can just get back to a purist, um, Salafist yeah, I get the analogy, interpretation yeah. of the Quran, and go back to the way things were pre-Ottoman collapse. Yes, yeah. yeah. If, um, not, if not before that, man. Like, yeah. Uh, but in their haste in, to try and I'm, get back I'm sure, there, I'm sure the Ottoman is actually probably uh, in breach of like many Salafist traditions as well, because they were remarkably tolerant of a lot of people within their own borders, and harems and shit like but, that. Yeah, know? but I, 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 I like I get and respect the analogy. Mm. It's uh, yeah, what they want is like they we, want to get the, back the to Salafist the Salafist tradition. Seems to be that like yeah, if we can only burn enough books and erase enough history, then we can go back to this. This I mean, the Nazis yeah. wanted the same thing that if you mm. can just get all the Jews out of the country or kill them and burn all their Fix literature, all the bombs, you can go yeah. back to the times where Herodotus. I think Herodotus, it could be someone else, Tacitus was writing about the the Germanic tribes across the Rhine fighting with the Gauls and the Romans and how pure they were and how pure of spirit and of blood. And if you can just get back there, be yeah, fine. Yeah. No matter how many pagan-esque rituals you have to engage in, how many goats you have to slaughter over sacred uh, pyres, yeah. you know, you'll do it. But I think the thing with Islam is they want to get back and what they've realized is that Urquhart's gone. And that they have to they have to formulate and redesign a new Islam for the twenty first century, and the Ottoman Empire one of its main problems just before the fall was that it was finding it very difficult to modernize. Mm. They started wearing those um, started wearing those what they call fezes, you know the yeah, fez. Yeah, yeah. That was a, a late invention in the eighteen seventies, I think. Could have been earlier right. than that or later than that. 
around that time, give or take, of the Ottomans to try and give their business class a more modernized look, but to still retain this this symbol of of Ottoman style I because they had yeah. largely begun to decay as a civilization as hmm. a culture, and it feels though these Islamists want to get back there. What they've realized is their quat's gone. And so what they try and get back to doesn't exist anymore. That's the worst thing. Yeah. But perhaps their long-term goal is to get back, get the caliphate back in order, uh, and and then they will begin to modernize. But that's been the argument of every yeah. dictator since the dawn of time. If I can just but take see, enough see, power like, and kill enough political adversaries, then eventually the training wheels will be taken off yeah. and this will become a democracy so in, once in more. And that's what this, Marx I guess, wanted. Like, the way I could maybe, like, summarize that is like if we can only retard society enough we will be able to make progress <laughs> yeah you know, like yeah. that's it's it's is perfectly like it's a perfect representation of how backward their thinking is mm. that this yeah it's, it's this pure intolerance for any view that is out with their mm. own that is blinds them from the fact that they aren't able to get back to what yeah. they want you know that the 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 kind of society that maybe their their preachers speak of that they maybe grew up in 50 60 years ago that's not going to be the case and it's never going to be the case mm. you know like you're not going to be able to remove twitter from saudi arabia no matter how conservative a society that is the people now have no matter how small and no matter how restricted they have a voice yeah. and they have a voice that is now able to be heard amongst their peers mm. beyond the street down the road or beyond yeah. the cafe you know th- this is now this is now a national dialogue that is going on globally mm. and you can't retract that you can't yeah. pull back from it because it's irreversible yeah. this is the progress of humanity this yeah. is the progress of civilization the this deeper. is this is what i see as globalization mm. the internet is the the most revolutionary invention in mm. the history of mankind the fact that you're going to upload this on the internet at some point yeah. and some random guy in america india wherever is going to actually be able to access it if they're that fucking broad. maybe even saudi arabia <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, uh, if it's not restricted yeah <laughs> they'll probably try and Just kill us be careful well, about know. the taglines that you put on there yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know the, the, the muzzy the, threat <laughs> yeah, but, you, but you know the, you get the idea that the yeah. um the this is something that's irreversible that you know uh, once you're exposed to this information you can't be unexposed to yeah it. and once i think you see that, it you can't unsee it yeah. yeah and i think that there's there's benefits to that mm. and i don't necessarily see it as a hindrance i mean like if you look at isis mm. one of the biggest things that they've done and one of the most uh, impressive things if i can call it that, that they've done is actually their use of the internet and their use of social media and their use of you know uh, live video or not live video sorry you know like um I guess real like sort of action video, you know, like yeah. things happening on the ground, and for 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 a young sort of jihadi sympathizer, maybe he doesn't really know that much about Islam, mm. but he likes the idea of having a gun and having a cause and wanting yeah. to go and fight someone. And that, I think that's a human. That's almost a human mm. instinct. I think that's going to increasingly become the case. I mean, the the internet's effect on society now. Mm. Do you ever stop for a minute? It's twenty fourteen now, and I was thinking about it today. I was using my iPod in the gym, and I was thinking. 10 or 14 years ago say 2000 this entire workout for me if i had to transplant myself mm. transport myself rather not like i would cut myself out yeah, of a yeah, larger yeah, yeah. organism <laughs> but maybe this society is the organism i would cut myself out of so maybe that analogy works yeah. you never know <laughs> i'll try i'll try and uh, i'll try and i'll try and justify it to myself later that analogy fucking worked um but it, you know if i just transplant cut myself out, from your own arse for yeah, a second transport yeah. myself and uh take myself back to 2000 this workout i'm doing at the gym right now would be intolerable yeah, no yeah. music i mean maybe i'd have a walkman or a cd yeah, player yeah. but those fucking things would skip all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean we've got one cd but also just the communications technology the effect that the internet has had on modern society it's almost like a benevolent virus yeah, because yeah. once it sinks its claws in deeper and deeper um the more your society more so your economy even potentially more importantly is reliant upon it and mm. because of the technology itself i feel as though the security could get better but the idea of one person breaking a code will never go away numbers will never go away in that yeah, sense yeah. Yeah. it's one of the interesting things that the internet's backed up on ones and zeros and and code mm. and so what you have is something you rely upon as a method of communication and hence a method of prosperity the case in the middle east is maybe that oil runs out or things are changed economically we find more renewable energies i think uh, they're going to become more and more reliant on it, and as a result, 
women are going to want to fucking drive. And there's nothing you can do about it because ultimately it's a method of technology that's very difficult to control yeah, yeah. and unpredictable and someone just writes a new virus to override the old uh you know kind of safeguards you made you, you wrote to defend against the last virus you yeah, know yeah. and it's and it's this form of technology that i feel will overwhelm a lot of these hmm. these um, because event eventually how much of an effect will it have proportional i mean the gdp of south korea is over a trillion the gdp of north korea is like 25 billion right or it's 30 billion I mean, there's a stupendous difference. I mean, it must be the biggest GDP inequality in the world from border to border because that demilitarized them. Well, yeah, it's unheard of in the history of the world for one people to be so unbelievably poor that are right next to another people that are that are fantastically wealthy by yeah, comparison. Yeah. Like thirty-seven thousand pounds a year or dollars a year is the average. Uh, and the advancement per of technology income. in the hands of the regular person yeah. as well. Like I think uh, I'm right in saying that North Korea doesn't really have an internet. They have like a uh, a localized version like an intranet that basically is just a regime propaganda machine it's yeah. like an online library book. and if they don't have you food know. how many of them have computers i mean yeah I, yeah i think about that and i think that there's maybe uh, a handful of people that have restricted internet access that are purely for the monitoring of like how north korea has been discussed outside the country yeah. and stuff that that was yeah i mean compare clearly. that compare that to like south korea where they have fucking international gaming cities yeah. and uh you know things like that that like the the reach of technology is so far beyond i mean like i think about myself like when's the last time the first thing i did in the morning wasn't check the web browser on my phone look at facebook look at you know mm. bbc news and things yeah. like that it's just it's a compulsion it's just yeah. what you do because in terms of social media so the degraded, last four yeah. years at least the last four years since two thousand mm. five years since 2009 i can't think of a day i haven't checked my th- yeah, facebook yeah. i can't think of one i'm sure there was one that went oh, by yeah, yeah. but well, that's, uh, the, that's it's a norm but i think yeah. that, that's what you're saying yeah, exactly it's uh, the if you could recall a day when you didn't, that shows how regular it is in your routine. Mm. But uh, to pull back on something that we were talking about earlier about you know um, this this sort of mass appeal and this uh, mass era of communication, I remember during the London Olympics a story about the Iranian women's football team. Mm. Now they were going to be playing in their sort of strip, but then they had full body cover as well apart from their face really? so their head would be covered their arms and legs would be fully covered as well there would be no flesh showing apart from that of their face right and i think fifa banned this uh-huh. or said that they wouldn't allow be allowed to travel with this strip if they wanted to play in the world cup they would have to adhere to the fifa dress regulations as mm. stated now i i think that the were eventually allowed to play. I think FIFA backed down on this. Now, at the time, I was intensely sort of militant about it, I guess you could say, mm. in, in believing that they shouldn't be allowed to play because I, I saw the hijab and things like that as yeah. a mass repression of women in Iran. Yeah. And uh, I thought that it was, it was disgraceful that we could allow them to think that this was acceptable. But actually, when I watched the games, and uh, I believe that Iran did play in this in this uh so the fifa backed down and they decided it wasn't worth the not letting them play they actually considered something different the the argument hadn't crossed my mind before that is that whoever iran are playing against are not going to be wearing a headscarf and Mm. things like you know if they're playing the swedish women's football team or or, you know german whatever the the people that are watching in iran the fact that their women are covered up is actually going to appear maybe strange or they're going to wonder why the women from the other countries aren't covered up yeah. like theirs are. So the fact that they went and played in their dress, I think maybe tells you, or the, the world sends a more powerful message by doing that yeah. and not adhering to it themselves. And I think that's an important thing to get is that, you know, no, it's, it's, not, it's not about being as militant with these people as they are with their views. Mm. It's about showing them how we conduct ourselves and yeah. how we conduct argument and how we conduct discussion. Yeah. And because if you, them, if you, yeah, if you resist it, all that. you breed is an inferiority yeah. complex where and they the, believe the we way, must be right, but there's still, there's exactly. yeah, some conspiracy here. And the way, the way you make them adhere to that is by leading by the example that you want to say. Yeah. And that is by not telling them that they can't do this. Because exactly. Of that. Yeah. It's by pointing out reasons why 
Exactly. This is maybe the best way to do Temptation things. is a big drive within all of these monotheistic yeah, yeah. Abrahamic religions. And maybe they think that women who are on Burkut, mm. <laughs> uh, Burkulus, uh, or, 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 or yeah, yeah deburked, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or or, or dejabbed, uh, <laughs> are are somehow there as a kind of well, the rest of the world wants to suck us down into this vortex of villainy and and uh, and immorality, yeah, um, and and lack of decency. Mm. But we won't be brought down. We we have this we have this feeling that we are we stand aside. We are superior. If you allow that, though, as you say, you're probably right. Yeah, hundred percent because. If you just leave that in the open, you watch the other people conduct mm. their affairs, it becomes like more and more absurd yeah, and more yeah, and more unnecessary. Precisely, precisely. Whereas if you resist it, you breed resistance within the thing that you resist. Exactly. And, and, and justification. It, and it gets to the point where you are having to censor and obstruct thoughts and actions that are so absurd because that's where you've got to it. Like, uh, to use another example from Tehran, you remember that like, Happy in Tehran video that was yeah, all published on the internet? And these people were arrested and the video was to be taken down and all this kind of stuff because women were dancing on the rooftops of Tehran without a headscarf on. Yeah. And it's literally about being pleased about living in Tehran, the capital of Iran. You know, you, you, you can't mm. get more detached from reality as a theoc- theocratic government when you're suppressing mm. literally happiness you know H- Hitchens, like, Hitchens said something yeah. about that he said it was, I don't think he, I, don't, I think it was the same analogy when he was talking about the surplus value of totalitarianism mm. but he was saying that governments that are authoritarian and to some extent in the case of Iran totalitarian I mean they're not yeah, totalitarian totally. in the case of North Korea no although no. they're still stoning people to death in some cases but they they're not as they're not as overtly brutal at least on the face they're, of it they're, North Korea are easy to make fun okay, of because they're all quite, fucking but nuts. They're still you very know? repressive of yeah. just basic human instinct. I mean, the worst thing is feeling, North Korea yeah. is incredibly easy to make fun of because yeah, precisely. And uh, you know because they they just they look daft. Their hats are too big. Yeah. I mean, have you ever noticed that about the military yeah, leadership yeah. in North Korea? Their hats are stupendously massive, <laughs> and they've all got all these medals. And you're like, well, surely any other country you would have won those from battlefield honors. Your country hasn't been at war in like fucking fifty years. Yeah, yeah. Where are you getting all these fucking medals from, son? And what are they made out of at this point? Because you have like no natural resources <laughs> except what the Chinese give you and what you manage to like extract through blackmail from the Americans mm. by threatening to nuke a bunch of StarCraft players in South Korea. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. Um, with your like four nukes right but like I mean enough to fuck over Seoul quite a mm. few times though but uh, the in Iran it's like what Hitchens talked about where it's not even that it's against the law it's just the regime has to do it at this point yeah, yeah. it just it must even if the video is about happiness you can you can actually undermine the regime where there's so much passive aggression like not only is the video called happy but we're gonna we know for a fact that they're gonna crack down on this and they they're doing it to the point where they're not even aware of how it looks. Yeah. So overtly, unbelievably ridiculous. And I feel like doing that is the ultimate sort of uh, kind of mole in the organization. Precisely. Maybe. Yeah. It's it's yeah it's it's the ultimate mass. It, they're they're causing. Uh, they, they, they're they're making the regime act masochistically. Yeah, because yeah. the regime doesn't actually have any choice at this point. It must act masochistically, even if it knows what it's doing is ultimately masochistic. So you know, so the newspaper headlines around but the to, world are to allow, the Ayatollahs yeah, yeah. block a video about happiness, and there's nothing they can do about it because if they, allow, if they allow one transgression, they allow the commission of more. Yeah, yeah the old line, yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, I feel but by, as though, but by denying it, all you're doing is restricting the boundaries even further. And then you're t- and then you're basically setting a challenge to your people. Say, well, okay, I'm going to do this, and now I'm going to find out if this is acceptable or not. Yeah. And then you push it a little bit further back, and then the public goes, right, okay, well, if this is the new line, then we're going to step a toe across mm. it again. And mm. it's it it doesn't matter how far back you set this line, yeah. people are always going to have a desire to cross it and desire to see how repressive the state actually is. Exactly. Because. There's, it's, it's human. It's human to want to escape that. Yeah. And that's what I believe is going to happen mm. in Iran eventually. And I don't think that we're going to get there by bombing it. Yeah. I think that you're going to achieve that through, I don't know, not exactly allowing it to run its course, maybe just like greater political integration uh, integra- uh, integration yeah. with the rest of the world, lowering sanctions if they 
continue to sort of seem like they're moving the mm. right way and if you look at the other sort of power broker in the region saudi arabia i don't feel like saudi arabia is anyone that should be closing up to yeah and i think that I. in terms of history in terms of culture in terms of civilization iran or persia is mm. so much further ahead yeah. and you know what this is another thing as well they went through that islamic revolution but there's still not a desire a mass desire to suppress the prehistory you know prehistory you know the ancient history mm. of iran yeah. they still are interested in teaching their people about the historic conquest of persia and things like that because it means as much to them as it does to uh, their islamic faith mm. and I think that that's why you're going to see a lot more from Iran. You're going to see a lot more culture and you're going to see a lot more progression than you will out of them mm. than you will from the Arabs. Because it, I think that yeah. Arab, Sunni Arab civilization, particularly Saudi Arabia and I guess the, the, Shia, the Sunni areas of uh, Iraq and uh, Syria, that they're, if, as they view themselves as Arabs, their Arab conquest was pretty much under the first caliphate. So they don't have a pre-Islamic tradition that they are yeah. aware of because anything pre-Islamic was mm. banned under Islam. Yeah, that's you that's know? yeah, that's one of those things. It was um that that when people talk about the the Muslim community in this country, mm. and obviously I don't think and I don't think you do either that the, you know the guy down the street is a fucking terrorist. No, it's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there is this idea though that, and you see it more and more that even the people who are not even willing to con you know to consciously permit violence in the name of their faith, yeah, yeah. which is the majority. Mm. still believe that in many ways even if they're liberal people and it's there it comes down to a point of view so i'm not going to dispute it like it's criminal mm. but it's worrying that there are a large number of people that say well no because islam uh it's it's it trumps whatever the nation's traditions are yeah yeah that's very dangerous but as we spoke about earlier our interpretation of what a nation is and their interpretation of what a nation is and i don't want to make it us or them i don't want to do that but to some extent that's been done long before we were born yeah yeah uh, potentially hundreds of years before we were born and the confrontations between east uh, western christendom which we're no longer a, a part of but and the east uh this idea that yeah, i don't think we get a choice a nation, in this confrontation but i do think we get a choice in how it's conducted yeah that the, the, this idea that there is islam yeah and that islam straddles borders it's the most all-encompassing you know uh a la carte well, not a la carte buffet kind of all-inclusive like in a hotel uh, religion but also in the case of of iran i find it fascinating this this thing where a minority of people can make overtures for change mm. like with a video like happy and they can be viewed as a minority but the response to their actions as a minority must come from an entity that overtly or or uh, ostensibly represents what they even in Iran would consider the majority. Yeah. The yeah. Ayatollahs are looking out for the majority of Muslims. They don't run Muslims. They are just the arbiters of Muslims in this world, which has, of course, never been the truth, but they'll always say but it. I think that they, uh, they probably genuinely believe that they dictate oh, the view of the but majority. But they must respond well, yeah. to the minority, hmm. which means the more and more they respond to the minority, all the minority needs to do is isolated incidents. Hmm. And, of course, the majority in the form of the government has to respond because it has to demonstrate that these isolated incidents are wrong, otherwise it loses its power, but in the act of doing that, it loses its power anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because the more and more extreme it gets, the more and more the majority that it purports to represent reject it. So I think it's this inherent advantage that I cannot think of. I was going to put myself in the shoes of a government. I cannot think of a counter to. Yeah, there isn't exactly. a counter to it's that. Not, yeah. There isn't because you can crack down on, the, on these guys and you lose, or you do nothing, and they gain traction, and you lose. Mm. So it feels like the days, especially in a world that's more interconnected, where people are, everything's done in the broad in broad daylight, relatively, because yeah, yeah, yeah. of communications technology. It feels like authoritarian regimes will become more and more impossible in the coming century. Definitely, in yeah. the rest of this century, you know. Um, I think it's an ability for people to uh, question what the man next to them or the woman, you know, I'm not going to be arsed about that, you know, what the man next to them is thinking. Yeah. And to wonder whether they're maybe thinking more along the mm. same lines than they've ever believed in history before. Mm. And because you have mass communication, yeah. uh, it's not exactly consensus exactly, but it's um, it's the ability to sort of just check yourself, check your opinion against, yeah. right, okay, what's the news saying right now? And then what are the the opinions of my peers yeah 
and social media and mass communication uh, over the internet and uh, the the wide array of news that's available to yeah. people in any country now, apart from North Korea, maybe. Yeah. Um, the thing that worries is, me is it, 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 it gives you that ability to sort of question your views and really wonder whether you are mm. actually in the minority. Yeah. And I think that that's something that's maybe undervalued in our society, yeah. that people are too concerned about having their own views and only being interested in their own views, never challenging them themselves. Mm. And I think we we maybe underappreciate that fact living yeah. in this country that we have this great freedom. We have the great freedom to openly view our own opinions and have them challenged over the internet just by reading articles that are contrary to our own positions. And people don't do that. People just reaffirm their own positions. They don't mm. use the new technology for the capability that it's actually there for. Yeah. They just use it to Augment build up. their previous. Yeah, yeah, precisely. precisely. And also, I worry about the internet becoming a service platform. Mm. In the case of the corporate interests and government interests, in my opinion, it's far more advantageous or desirable, rather, for the internet to become a service platform and for you to drown out those elements of communication. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you already see it happening. I mean, the the idea of closing down comments threads. The more the government talks about troll commenters, the more troll commenters I see. Yeah, I don't yeah. think that that's <laughs> a coincidence. I think that if you just make something uh, maybe contrary or undesirable, people mm. will do it. Yeah, yeah. And so they're using that mechanism of human nature against the collective... In a, in a way that I, it's frustrating because the internet for me has been this this great and last bastion by which we can finally free like ourselves. The impulse was going to be challenged. This yeah. Did. yeah, exactly. And I, I look forward to people like Google, provided there's still a conversation ongoing and that they haven't shut down. I mean, the BBC news website used to have comments threads. Hmm. They're gone as well now. Really? Yeah. I've noticed them on some articles recently. Yeah. But, I, I, or, you well, you, you almost recently. never get them on current events articles yeah. anymore. And of course, because half the oh, people... It's because, of, I mean, have you ever actually read any yeah. of them? Yeah. Yeah. I know. But I worry that this will be taken as, well, the majority don't want to have larger discussions mm. because they always devolve to that. Probably, That's a great yeah. president's to set to say, well, let's do away with them altogether. But I would like a company like Google to, to develop more, put more development, rather, into their... Um, Google Translate system yeah, yeah. and have it be instantaneous the minute that another language is detected that it is automatically translated and underneath it, it says which language it's been translated from right, yeah, whereas yeah. you know that it has been translated hmm. to, to have an understanding that this is someone that's spoken in another language and that what they've said has been more or less seamlessly and of course it doesn't account for the spelling of the average yeah, human yeah. being on the internet uh, I take actually great care in spelling properly on the internet. I don't know what it is. I try to. I, I use Google, uh, the Google Quick Search Bar yeah. as a dictionary, basically. If I'm unsure yeah. about the spelling to or I'm unsure about as well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. You just you punch it in, and it's like, oh, it's actually you know a before l in the spelling, yeah. and then oh, it tells me the definition. And oh, what's that? There's additional free definitions there. Yeah. So I now know that I can use this word in another context. Yeah. That's a great exactly. Thing and have. justify it later if it's challenged. Precisely. You know? yeah. But it's um, I, I worry. I worry and i feel as though that would that would that would rev that would cause an, a second surge second revolution in communications mm. if the things that you hear people babbling about on tv i think eventually they're going to find a way to do it in an audio sense where it's where it's instantaneously translated as they're seeing it or with the, maybe a two second delay yeah. different from maybe a translator doing it over the top like the idea of a translator doing it over the top but it being automated yeah 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 I feel as though in the next 10, 20 years, that's going to become a thing like a universal translator, hmm. which is a big thing in science fiction, that will eventually just break down these barriers. They'll no longer matter. Um, the, the language barrier specifically. Yeah, yeah. Esperanto will become, you know, kind of defunct as, as a way to solve that problem. We will create our own binary Esperanto, a bridging language between all other languages, you know. Um, but I thought we could wrap it up there, man, because we're at the... 49 minute mark it's not too bad I'm sure Are you, you do you have anything else you want to talk about um <laughs> no, I, just, no, I, just, I just I think um, just kind of getting on to what we were talking about earlier just the the kind of 
the need to be offensive when you feel like people will be offended. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Nah, 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 I don't include that. No, nah, it was, it was kind of just on that, like, mm. South Park vibe, you know, when we're talking about... Mm. Uh, actually, nah, I've not really got anything no, else. That's right. I definitely cut out that. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, it's fine. Cut it off. Leave it in. Just like... <laughs> <laughs> just well, like nah. yeah, nah. Give, me, was, give me a second of silence, and then I'll, I'll pretend that this part didn't happen and see. Sorry. Yeah, all right, thanks for listening. You might need to have it in your hand so you can say goodbye. <laughs> Sorry. You know, like, when it gets to the point where it's painful. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's cool. Holy I'm, shit. I think I'm getting there as well. <laughs> right. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot for being on the show. Appreciate uh, it. I've had a great time. Uh, we'll definitely have you on again next couple of weeks. We'll definitely have you on again. We- I, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I have like an imaginary fucking producer. Or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a one man show, ladies and gentlemen. I produce. We, I mean, that's crazy. That's like an imaginary podcast. We would love to have you on again. Yeah, yeah. It's right, your we, producer and director. It's just all the ghosts from Harry <laughs> Potter when he meets his family at the end, you know. It's just serious. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff, How are you man. getting on with the audio? Well, um, yeah, it was, it was it's all, as always, good to talk shit with you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I'll see you later on, folks. Bye.